Okay, good morning. Uh, we thought that it would be nice to continue the dancing of yesterday evening by presenting you with a little bibliometric dance. Wolfgang and I will present together. I will say a few short words to introduce the 10 do's and don'ts in individual level bibliometrics. Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to squeeze the 20 points in 30 minutes. Uh, First, let me uh, introduce what, what the idea basically is. The idea is not to present a polished paper. It's not polished at all. But it's, um, it's an attempt to set up a debate in the community to take our responsibility in a more systematic way, perhaps, than we have done so far. But we don't want to set up a bibliometric police. So the idea basically is to generate a community debate and what we will present are 10 points, really draft points, and we assume that you will be able to both listen and read. So I'm, for example, not telling you what's on the screen because you are perfectly able to read that yourself. Um, the project started with Jochen Glaser and Ismail Rafels coming over to us, Wolfgang and me, and proposed to, to generate this debate. We will have a debate here, then the ideas will be processing the results, and continue the discussion at the STI conference in Berlin. And then in the course of next year, we want to involve the stakeholders of this whole enterprise. So the people who are actually using individual level bibliometrics like deans, rectors, research managers, and we want to set up a dialogue with them to see what they need in terms of bibliometric expertise and ethical and political guidelines. So that's the project. It's not a normal paper, it's really a debate, and we would be very happy if you would severely uh, critique the points and come up with better ones. Thank you. Both okay, time. thank you very much, Paul. Okay, so here we come to the first don'ts, and uh, the very first uh, place uh, we have placed uh, uh, the use of a single uh, number in the framework of individual performance, which is one of, uh, of course, the basic don'ts. Um, research performance is influenced by many factors, as we know, such as age, position, time window, and the research domain, of course. This also applies to any other level of uh, aggregation, but here it's really crucial. So the constitution of any research team is very unique. Uh, the position and the profile of individual researchers is very unique and particular. So the scholars have... Uh, uh, live uh, and work in an environment and a position in an interaction with colleagues, uh, collaborating uh, with colleagues. They are mobile, and uh, as a result, their profiles uh, will uh, considerably differ. And even if we use sound data, clean data, and uh, methodological sound indicators, we will not be able to reflect research performance, uh, research activity um, uh, of individuals or research teams uh, adequately by using one single number. Okay, so we always have to uh, use or take to account uh, the working context of a researcher. Okay, the second one, this is a very often uh, discussed issue, is the use of impact factors uh, as a measure of quality. Of course, uh, the impact factors have their history and uh, also their merits. But they, we have to keep in mind that they have been created and uh, developed to uh, supplement a, a citation database. And later on, as uh, Savage uh, expressed it, they have evolved to a, a common currency of uh, scientific quality in research evaluation. And this is a problem. Okay? It has been shown by uh, several scientists, uh, above all by, by P.O. Seglin, that the impact factor is by no means a performance measure of individual articles nor of the authors of these papers. And um, nowadays we have, uh, most recently actually, we have uh, some campaigns again using the impact factor in the framework of evaluation of individual scientists. We have that in Germany. I'm uh, just uh, displaying here some names. And uh, most recently we have also the DORA uh, declaration uh, that started a, a, a campaign against uh, the use of impact factors in the evaluation of researchers and research groups. Okay. A third issue, don't apply hidden or any other bibliometric filters for selection. This is a bit based on rumors, but I have knowledge of some cases 
where impact factors, agent excitation counts are used as filters, as thresholds for certain things. For instance, in uh, there are places where uh, a threshold is set to impact factors. If you report your publication records, uh, if you have publications in, in journals uh, below a certain impact factor, you don't need to report them. They do not sim they simply do not count. I have heard that uh, you need a certain age index to take a degree in some places. And I have heard, and this is not a rumor, that uh, a certain number of citations and publication is needed for promotion. Okay, this is very harmful, and it has also, it's of course incorrect, and this has also a strong psychological effect on uh, the scientists, uh, and that should not be underestimated, okay? The fourth issue is uh, choosing arbitrary weights, and here we have an example. It's the arbitrary weights uh, assigned to co-authorship. It is clear that most papers are co-authored, nowadays by several scientists. And the contribution of each author, of each co-author, is not the same. We know that. And we can try to measure it a bit. We know that the first author, the corresponding author, maybe the last author, has a bit uh, more contributed, but it's not sure. Sometimes an alphabetic order is applied. Uh, it, it's the authors themselves who can decide who has contributed what to the paper. Now calculating simply using algorithm based on the position in the uh, sequence of co-authors and uh, applying weights might be very, very problematic and, of course, sometimes even misleading. A further issue, which is a bit linked to the first one. Don't rank scientists according to one indicator. Of course, ranking scientists is legitimate. If you have a shortlist of candidates, Candidates are very often ranked according to several viewpoints and aspects. It's quite okay. But as soon as ranking becomes uncoupled from any particular aim, then it becomes uh, problematic. There's also an ethical issue around that. Um, and we have found that uh, uh, there are possible repercussions of uh, such uh, how we call it, Champions League mentality, which is emerging among scientists, which is, uh, has a little to do with the scientific and scholarly work. But if uh, lists of scientists are used, ranked by bibliometric indicators, you have to keep in mind that uh, these lists might be used in a context uh, for that these lists have not been designed. So for decision-making in a completely different context. So avoid uh, uh, scientists, uh, 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 ranking list of scientists according to bibliometrics. Just uh, rank scientists if you need it for a particular aim. Okay, the dance goes in double time. Uh, don't merge uh, incommensurable measures. The idea is here that we should help users to understand to what extent indicators and data sources can be combined and how they should be combined. Um, uh, this is especially relevant because in many cases at the individual level, bibliometric data sources are not enough. So they need to be supplemented with other sources and this puts uh, an even higher uh, emphasis on the need to carefully balance uh, the matter of commensurability. Seven point, this is a general point of course for all bibliometrics not specific to the individual level. Statistics. Uh, we have fundamental debates about the best way to perform statistics, also in our community. Uh, at our center in Leiden, we are also developing these ideas, moving away from statistical testing, uh, significant testing and flowing into what's called the new statistics. But of course, you can have different approaches here. The point is that statistics is even more critical at the level of the individual. It has always been the excuse in bibliometrics for a long time to claim that we shouldn't apply bibliometrics at, at the individual level at all. This is a station, this is a point of, uh, that we have passed. It's not possible anymore to maintain this. We would also leave our users in the cold if we would uh, uh, make this simple statement. So we need to find ways to, uh, to combine uh, uh, bibliometric uh, data in a statistically valid way. 
Um, this is a point that uh, Blaise, in his beautiful speech yesterday, also showed. Uh, one hit wonders. So uh, the, uh, the, the citation, identity or equality almost, of a famous breakthrough book with a one uh, uh, hit paper. Um, clearly, uh, this is problematic. The point here is not so much whether or not these uh, high hits should be counted. Clearly, they are happening, so they are relevant. And we wouldn't want to rob a scientist, of course, of his beautiful super paper. Um, but uh, we must couple it with an understanding of how science progresses. So what is the structure of scientific progress? And there are different dynamics here. There are different ways to make scientific breakthroughs. And this is important to also uh, somehow uh, acknowledge in, in the way we, we uh, analyze this bibliometrically. Of course, don't compare apples and oranges. Um, this is not very original. Uh, it's a modern and, uh, apple pie thing. Uh, nevertheless, uh, often it, uh, it, it, it is problematic how this is being, uh, being done in practice. Um, so here the context of the working scientist is very important. The culture and the mission of the researcher um, and uh, the way uh, scientific communication is structured. Uh, this is especially important if you want to translate uh, traces of communication into indicators of evaluation, which is a different context. Uh, last point, um, we have had a bit of a debate about this also in our institute in Leiden. Very often uh, faculties, uh, universities even sometimes uh, groups, come with a request for a bibliometric analysis two days after the deadline that they should have already had it. So uh, this is a bit of a, there is always a lot of time pressure. In, uh, in, in, in surface contracting bibliometric work. Uh, nevertheless, we should try to teach ourselves and our users to take more time, to, to be more uh, forward-looking and planning uh, uh, so that we can uh, do the work that is needed uh, in, in the proper time frame. And the, the point here is we shouldn't allow deadlines and workloads uh, to, 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 yeah, to creep into uh, the quality of our work and to lower the quality of our work. That is an important issue. Okay, Wolfgang continues to dance in single time yeah. again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I take over for the uh, first five do's. So, uh, ten things you might do. Uh, in the very first place, of course, you have to keep in mind that also individual level uh, bibliometrics is statistics. This uh, uh, looks like a platitude, but uh, we have to keep in mind because statistics uh, has rules. Yeah? So you have basic measures that are very important, like publication citation counts, but all uh, measures you derive from uh, these basic measures um, uh, are statistics, and uh, even if uh, the counts um, are sufficiently large, you can apply mathematical statistics. Sometimes if I receive submissions, I have uh, the impression that uh, authors are just uh, considering indicators as a uh, um, numerical game of uh, kind of that. So it is statistics and it has to be the rules of statistics. Um, of course, you can uh, create uh, the conditions that you can apply even mathematical statistics by choosing a, a longer publication period. Uh, of course, um, you need uh, some uh, benchmarking, some reference uh, standards for benchmarking, of course. And uh, Special issues, of course, especially nowadays in, in, uh, in uh, some uh, fields of physics and the life sciences where you have uh, group authorship, which is a very special issue, and uh, yeah, you have to uh, treat that uh, adequately. Okay, um, the second issue is uh, analyze collaboration profiles of researchers. Uh, even in mathematics, uh, which was a domain for a long time where uh, authors uh, have published uh, is, uh, alone, uh, the situation has dramatically changed and you have uh, co-authorship and collaboration in any field today, in the social sciences, even in the humanities. So, of course, you have to keep in mind um, who is collaborating with whom and who, uh, who uh, holds a certain position in that collaboration. 
So you can, uh, for instance, analyze, and you should analyze, if an author is preferably uh, working alone, uh, is working in stable teams, or the prefers, more prefers a patient collaboration. And you can have a look if the author is the junior co-author, a peer, or the senior co-author in the publication he or she reports in um, uh, her um, or his uh, CV. So this might also help to ident identify the scientist's own role in uh, the research environment, uh, and this is important if you uh, draw conclusions uh, in combination with qualitative methods. Okay, third one, always, this leads us to the third issue, always combine quantitative and qualitative methods. Okay, and at this level of engagement, this is feasible as well. Huh? And it's not only feasible, it's a basic requirement. Um, on one hand, bibliometrics can, of course, support and supplement uh, the sometimes uh, subjectively colored qualitative methods. We know that uh, qualitative methods uh, is based, for instance, on expert opinion or peer reviews, uh, is uh, sometimes a bit biased uh, towards subjective uh, opinion. And you have to be mean to, to add some objective figures to this to underpin or to, con or to confirm arguments uh, by, by uh, individuals. Of course, you might also find uh, uh, discrepancies between the qualitative and the quantitative methods, but this is no reason to condemn or to uh, reject one of the two methods. You should rather look at what is in the background, what's the cause for this discrepancy, and to find the reason for that, you might even benefit from this uh, comparison. Okay. The fourth one, use citation context analysis. This is not new. It has been uh, first mentioned, we think it was first, uh, Borovsky in 1973. Uh, there's also a paper by Susan Cousins, uh, Cousins in 91. Uh, and later it has been suggested by Tibor Braun, uh, and it has been used in Hungary uh, around uh, 2000. What is meant by that? It's not uh, uh, in, uh, based on an algorithm looking at uh, uh, the location of a citation in a, within an article or the distance between two different uh, references as is done uh, by several uh, um, others. Here it is something different. It looks at the real context of a citation. If a citation is used, is discussed, criticized, or whatsoever. So the context might, of course, than the positive or negative. So it is something in between qualitative and quantitative methods, and it can be used in the case of individual proposals and applications, for instance. Okay. The fifth one, analyze subject profiles. So many scientists are working in an interdisciplinary environment. And even the reviewers of uh, their work might work in different panels. Huh? And the situation is even worse if you look at so-called polydisciplinary scientists. There are scientists, even in our field, who are still uh, working as uh, physicists or chemists, and at the same time they are active in, in bibliometrics or social sciences. So you have three basic approaches how to, uh, uh, how to have a look at their publication output and their research performance. Of course, you can consider all activities and you can define an adequate topic for, their, for benchmarking. You can split up their activities and you can have a look at their components. And of course, you can simply neglect some activities and just focus on that scope you need. Of course, it depends on the task, which of the three methods should be applied. applied. And of course, we need some more uh, research on this issue. Okay, an interesting point uh, uh, that we think should also be on the list of possible do's, so positive ways to use individual level bibliometrics is to make an explicit choice for the analysis of an oeuvre or a more uh, a focused analysis on a specific slice. And this could also be moving, of course. Uh, benchmarking would be an option here. It really depends on the kind of question that is on the table. And we should keep in mind here that these positive tense are actually also meant to recommend possible uses of bibliometrics by individual researchers themselves that they might not have thought about so far. So it can be an extremely useful instrument to support also uh, the individual researcher. 
uh, in this respect, we think it's a very promising area to, under, to try to combine bibliometrics with career analysis, both in, in our field, so for example by studying the development of careers with bibliometric means, but in this framework we would emphasize more the other side, to understand how bibliometrics should be related to the specific stage of the career in which the researcher is involved or, or what kind of step the researcher wants to take in her uh, career. And of course this is uh, complicated stuff. Uh, career studies are, always not, uh, are not always already at the stage that, they, uh, that we want them to be. So this is uh, basically combining two developing areas. Um, well, this is a bit of an obvious point in a way, clean the stuff. We already had it uh, in a negative form in the first 10 don'ts, uh, so we thought, well, maybe it's nice to emphasize again in the 10 do's, because cleaning up data can be very uh, uh, nice work. Um, and, but the point here, of course, is that a small mistake can have a huge consequence for an individual researcher. Uh, and uh, this, this means that there should be some form also often of collaboration with the researcher. So here um, it's, it's usually uh, uh, possible to make the researcher aware of the exercise and to involve him or her. You think that would be ethically the best thing. Sometimes it has to happen in a more confidential way because of the kind of question that's on the table. So for example, somebody is considered for an important prize and the prize doesn't allow the candidates to know that beforehand, then there should be standardized ways so that we are sure of the quality of the data involved. Uh, this is a point that we think is very important, the, the do. Uh, we don't mean this, so some don'ts are not taboo. Um, this because uh, the context varies so much and the questions vary so much and also there are different approaches within bibliometrics and we shouldn't, certainly wouldn't want, uh, I repeat it again, to act as the bibliometric police. Uh, we don't think that would be proper. So the point here is that, um, that there are always exceptions, there are always possibilities to use an indicator or a particular approach for a particular uh, goal. So here are some examples on the screen. Um, an example of good practice and a questionable use. Of course, this is up for discussion in the community. I can imagine that this is also a dynamically de evolving issue that perhaps in 10 years' time, because of other structures of databases, we would think otherwise about these things. But this is an important point. Uh, we don't mean it as a leak to allow everything, but we mean it as a way to be sensitive to the, to the, to the, to the context in which the bibliometrics is applied. And last point, we should be much more outgoing and proactively engaging uh, the users, um, not only by giving uh, good uh, and solid training, of course, but also by listening to the needs, the developing needs of the users, and to try to, uh, to involve that in both basic and applied bibliometric research. Uh, and it does also mean, and this is a bit sometimes difficult when, it's, when commercial interests are involved, we should always give uh, enough emphasis on the limitations of our work. Um, and sometimes this, this tends to uh, mean that you, you're exuding a bit of a negative atmosphere, uh, you're, you're showing how a u indicator is used, can be used, very nice, good stuff, and then you spend 10 minutes on the limitations. Uh, that is sometimes a bit confusing, but we think it is a good practice. And uh, uh, in, uh, at ISSI, it has always been the standard to have an academic approach to bibliometrics uh, and to balance the, the critical points and the strong points. Okay, um, these were our 10 do's and don'ts. Uh, we don't claim that we know uh, that we are the best uh, knowledgeable in the community. We think actually that a lot of uh, researchers in the audience know more about these issues than we do, but we think it's time to concentrate our energies and try to combine our insights to come up with some guidelines that can help, uh, can help uh, the users. Um, 
and it's clear that uh, some of the uh, soundness and validity of the results uh, of the methods is, uh, is an important issue that, that keeps coming uh, uh, on the table. And uh, I would like to give the floor to Wolfgang to end this presentation. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, of course, um, uh, we had, uh, I just uh, would like uh, to remind you on the uh, workshop we had um, on um, uh, standards in classification and, and mapping. So we had already several workshops in bibliometrics on standards. And uh, uh, if you look at this level, it's even more difficult to find uh, or define any standard for uh, uh, evaluation at the individual level. It's quite impossible at the moment. So we need some research on that because the diversity of tasks at this level is, is uh, enormous. So of course, and this is uh, uh, one uh, reason why we need absolute soundness and uh, validity of methods and accuracy at this level because, as Paul uh, told you, uh, a small error can have uh, uh, um, uh, enormous uh, effect. And um, we, have, uh, we recommend, therefore, to use individual level bibliometrics always on the basis of particular research portfolio. Um, of course, it's always important to combine bibliometrics with quantity qualitative uh, information about career and working contests. And we need all this information about the research mission and the profile and the goal of the researcher. So these are the crucial uh, uh, issues in individual bibliometrics we would like to, uh, yeah, at least to scratch here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the presenters to give us a list of uh, to-dos and not to-dos, uh, which we can certainly discuss um, at great length. But now the first thing we do is to ask um, Hank Moot to come up here and give his commentaries, please. Well, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to comment on the previous lecture, which was, of course, very interesting. I want to underline that it contains lots of valuable suggestions. I want to underline as well, though, that I'm active in this field for 30 years. I think we're discussing the pros and cons of indicators already for 30 years. And what we're doing now is the continuation of what we started many years ago. This discussion is not only taken place in our community, but also with users or potential users. As an example, I would like to mention a report of the expert group of the assessment of university-based research published in 2010 that introduces the concept of the so-called multidimensional research assessment matrix. And the base idea of the matrix, you have to read it column-wise, by the way, is that you have the various types of units of assessment, you have the various types of purposes of output dimensions, indicators, bibliometric ones and other ones, and what's absolutely essential, and it was actually underlined also in the, in the previous lecture, is that the choice of the indicators very much depends upon what is the unit to be assessed, what is the aspect to be assessed, and why is the assessment done anyway. And indicators that are appropriate in one type of assessment may be entirely inappropriate in another type. I heard very many valuable notions. This is a list of at least some of them. I cannot discuss them all. I would like to mention that there is a, a, a discussion or that, that we, we need to talk later in the discussion about whether or not impact factors are substitutes of actual impact of papers of researchers. Uh, I also would like to underline that implicitly to what has been presented in the previous lecture is also some uh, main lines of what you can say as a say an interpretational manual that has to be provided by the produ producers of the indicators eh? because we have the user side but we also have the producers and indeed we could formulate criteria to with which the users should actually comply the base problem as regards uh, 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 assessment at the level of individuals 
is, I believe, this. How can we assess the performance of an individual by analyzing products that are the result of teamwork? And this is a problem because most research articles that we analyze in bibliometrics are actually the result of a collaboration within or between teams. And we are inclined to say often, I published eight papers or I published 50 papers or so. But if you then look at the author list, for instance, you see that it is a, a, a combined effort of many different people. And then the question is, what is the role of one particular person in that team? And that is characteristic for assessment at the individual level. Many of the issues that were raised in the previous lectures, valuable as they are, relate to assessment in general. But I think this is one that very much focuses on assessment of the individual. I would like to make two comments. I think I have the time. First of all, I would like to warn against a too simplistic statements about rules, about do's and don'ts, what can be done and what cannot be done. The police state, state idea is something that I find horrifying. I want to give you two examples, and then I have one slide putting things in a slightly wider perspective. First this, of course, if you, at the, at the policy level, you have more and more uh, cases in which you have to e evaluate individual researchers. If then the policy measure is to use easily available metrics and then as a criterion count publications or numbers of articles in journals with the highest impact factors, I don't think this is a, a, a proper way of reaching a conclusion as to which indicators are appropriate or not. And actually there are many other types of indicators that can be used in this context than simply the journal impact factors. I want to underline that very clearly. But now this, suppose you are a minister and you have very strong evidence that in your country the research community is very nationally oriented, published mainly in national journals, do not reach out to an international community, do not expose their work to the, the views of international peers. Suppose all this is the case. Then one of the measures you could take is to define some kind of a policy in which you stimulate publications in good international journals. And if that is what you want to achieve, then a way to operationalize this is count the number of articles in the first impact quartile of journals in the subject field because most of the national journals are not in that quartile. They are in the third or the fourth quartile. You may know that there are several countries that have explicitly followed this type of reasoning. And I only want to say now, is this really bad? Is this very different from the problem that I indicated in case number one? I mean, we're not talking here about assessing uh, uh, hiring or uh, pr uh, promotion of personnel at good European universities. That's one thing. Second thing, maybe I make things worse now, you have countries in which professors are legally bound to do research, but many don't. This is another do and don't uh, thing. So then the measure could be allow only research active, active professors to decide on the recruitment of research staff, because that's one of the problems. If people who do not do research have to decide on who is going to be appointed at research positions, we don't want that. Now, is it really unreasonable then to apply as a criterion that only professors with at least three publications in seven years uh, can enter these recruitment committees? Again, this is not the problem of a, a promotion and hiring of in a set of reasonably good to very good researchers. No, this is a very serious pro policy problem. And the minister in this particular case needs indicators. And I believe that even the simple publication indicators are uh, appropriate here. Last but not least, I've said it many times, I'm, I'm, I'm very much uh, 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 pro serious discussions about potentialities and limitations of indicators. Absolutely, we should do that. But there is another side of the coin too. I, had, 
I don't hear anyone talking about what are acceptable error rates in assessment processes. We know even in, in studies by Cole and Cole at the very beginning on the National Science Foundation that a system can be wrong in individual cases but nevertheless be beneficiary for the system as a whole. So these are also issues that I think we should address. And what is very important, and uh, it was implicitly in the previous lecture too, we need some kind of a conception of what is a fair assessment process. Maybe we can discuss this further in the discussion. Thank you very much for giving me the uh, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much for these very interesting comments. This university is just going through the preparation of, um, of an audit of our quality assurance system. So this is very interesting to, to hear from me, very instructive. So now we have our second uh, commentator, Gunnar Sigurdsson, and please come up here and give your comment. Let me say right from the start that I agree with those 20 points and that I'm not going to give them a critical discussion. Instead, I will point at two questions that may be arising down the road and that we could discuss already now. I think we have a situation now where a, a vice rector can open the conference by expressing the concerns about bibliometrics on the individual level. We did not have that situation 30 years ago. Something has happened in between. And this discussion is more relevant to a larger audience than just for our community. And that is my first question. What would be the main target audience if it would, could be feasible and advisable to develop this discussion into a kind of official set of recommendations? Who would we then write them for? Now, our discussion so far, from our discussion so far, it seems that we are addressing our own community. But I don't think that is where this is most needed. I think we are in the community discussing malpractices and proper use of bibliometrics all the time. And we are also addressing these problems when we educate new practitioners and researchers in the field. Now, of course, there are a lot of use of bibliometrics out there by consultancies who never contribute to the journals or to the conferences, and then that might be a possible audience. But they relate to users, users that, that are the funding organizations and the administrative level of the universities and other research institutions. And in this perspective, they become the most important audience. And this was expressed already on Tuesday by the Vice Rector. We need, we need to know what you regard as proper use in order to tell our researchers. But even in that speech, it was revealed to us that there is also already a concern and a knowledge about bibliometric indicators on the administrative level. So that might not even be our most important target audience. What I'm coming to is that the researchers themselves are probably our main target audience because of the growing practice of using bibliometrics on the individual level when, when they evaluate each other and themselves uh, in different contexts. We know that contrary to the instructions of research councils, even on the highest European level, contrary to the instructions to panels that they should not use bibliometric indicators but make a sound review of the publications and the proposals, they are still used as the panel closes the door and starts its work. Now, you may discuss my impression of the, of the situation, but if it's so, 
that this would be the main audience. I think there would be fewer points. I think there would be more ex direct, uh, explicit ex expression of the use of peer review, of assessment in general, and also about looking at the context and careers. Then, if we were to recommend proper indicators, they would of course be normalized. And now I arrive at my second question, which is I will just put out shortly. They should be normalized. We should have a standard re reference standards, and they should be updated all the time. Now, for, to, for to constructing these reference standards, we need the total database. So my last question is, if would it be possible to update these reference standards and make them available to all researchers? And if this is not the case, why is it not possible to make those data available to all researchers? Thank you. <laughs>